All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Um, uh, welcome to our first Sociedad University class of Season 2, How to Turn More Leads into Conversations. Um, by the way, apologies for that email mishap this morning. That was a hashtag Marketo fail from my end. And Adam here, who's on the on the <laughs> class with me here, he's uh, he's laughing at me because he's my Marketo admin, and he's going to take away my access. Just kidding. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> so, welcome everybody. Um, again, really gra glad to have you here. I know I see a bunch of people that I know, and also some people that I don't know, which is great to have you all here. Um, some of uh, most of the people on here are customers. Um, uh, and, and it's always good to have customers on here, but we are also um, uh, allowing some non-customers to be on here um, just because we thought this would be a good um, potential partnership between our marketing department and our customer department just because Adam's got some good insights um, on what we're doing here uh, with turning leads into conversations because that's somewhat his job, and then I do as well because I work with a lot of our customers on doing exactly this. So... Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, that's kind of my thoughts there on uh, on Sociedad University season two. So so let's chat a little bit about season two here. Um, this is um, our list of classes that we are going to be going through. Um, so how to turn more leads into conversations? That's this one. Um, so getting more value out of your leads, integrating for easy nurturing is in two weeks, then increasing lead volume, optimizing your account for higher follow-back rates. Um, we're going to talk about how to create a, a great Twitter profile, um, what's going to get you more follow-backs because of a limited number of engagements, like how are you going to get more follow-backs. Um, uh, then getting more value out of your leads, tracking lead-by-lead lead conversions. We've heard a lot of comments about the tracking pixel and it's confusing to actually operate. So we're going to do a whole Sociedad University class around, you know, how do you do it for WordPress, for HubSpot, for Marketo, for um, uh, Unbounce, for, you know, any, uh, all these types of uh, landing page vendors we're, we're going to try and get some, uh, get some guides out there for. Then we're going to kind of go into some strategic uh, items, uh, setting great marketing goals, so how to set marketing goals. Um, then ask the coach. That's where you'll come prepared with questions, and I'll just answer questions about anything. So it's kind of an AMA, uh, except on GoToWebinar. Um, <laughs> increasing lead volume, multiple accounts, uh, new campaign dashboard, this little product uh, feature preview. Um, we're releasing a new multiple campaigns dashboard um, that will allow you to manage all of your Sucido accounts in now a campaign format. And so we'll be talking about that how to sell to social leads um, kind of uh, relates to this one, but more about the context for selling to social leads and how to train your sales team. What are the one or two things they can take away right now to sell to social leads? Achieving great marketing goals kind of as a sequel to setting great marketing goals. And then uh, increasing lead volume, creating great landing pages. We always want to be uh, updating this content because uh, landing pages, landing page trends change all the time, and we always get new advice. So we want to share that out. So anyways, this is kind of how season two is going to look. If you have any things that you want to add to this, if you're like, hey, I'm really confused about this, it would be great if you did this topic, always feel free to email us, um, university at Sociedo.com will come right to us, right to me, and I can, uh, I can help you out with um, how to actually get that in the program because that's what we, we always want to be responsive to what people want to hear about. So. Yeah. Cool. I'd just like to remind anyone who's on here who's not a customer, um, you do have access to two Sociedo U classes for free. Um, so feel free to attend Sociedo.com slash university. This is one of them. You can pick another one in this series. Um, and we do have our weekly marketing webinars as well that is open to everyone, and some of the topics are complimentary. So go ahead and check out our resources page, and you can see what's available to you. Nice plug there, Adam. Thank you. Yeah, we try. We try and get our plugs in there at the beginning. So I also wanted to talk a little about, uh, bit about us. So um, I just wanted to put up a team, uh, team photo now, a uh, couple caveats here. But uh, just so you're aware, this is me and this is Adam. So this is us. Um, Adam is right now cringing. He really didn't want me to do this. But I wanted to showcase who we are. If you haven't met us in person, we're really nice people. Just really, really nice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and also, just so you know, team in real life may be bigger than it appears. 
we have, just after we took this picture, well, actually we were missing a couple people that day, and we've pretty much doubled in size, and we're still growing. So just so you know, this is back when we were a little smaller, and uh, but that's me on the right, and that's Adam in the center there. So um, just so you know who we are. But here's the big secret. Adam and I actually went to college together. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, so I decided today to share, just as a little bit of an aside before we get into the content here, um, something from college, probably one of our biggest accomplishments that we did together. So when I was a uh, student body president and Adam was on student senate, we, uh, we passed an endowment to help student scholarships and reduce student fees. So I actually found this article. I searched Adam Hutchinson, Nate Strong, and this article came up from our college newspaper. So really great. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's good history, but just you can always make fun of us later about our college days and, and the things that we did. So, um, and so without further ado, let's get into the content. So today we're going to talk about um, your funnel. So in general, how does your funnel look? How should it look? What, what do you need to do to make sure you're creating more conversations out of your leads and uh, do um, uh, funnel efficiency on that? The, the next one is uh, we're going to go through the three rules of getting more conversations. So what are those three rules? How can we execute on them to get more conversations out of your leads? Some sample cadences. I'll go through one in particular from our end. Um, we'll talk about how to develop them. And, uh, and, you know, also feel free to share the cadences that you're interested in as well. Uh, and then uh, how do we get some marketing and sales alignment on turning conversations into lead be leads because that's kind of the main point, right, is how do we get aligned from, uh, from marketing and sales, right? So, cool. Also, uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, in that questions box there. I always want to uh, answer those as much as possible, as quickly as possible. So along the way, be asking them. We'll get to them at the end. Uh, we have a space for questions. Um, so we'll get to them at the end and uh, always happy to answer them uh, if we don't answer them in the, uh, along the way. So, cool. So let's start. Let's talk about your funnel. So, you know, I put this up here because, you know, I want to make sure we're on the same page. So when I think of a B2B marketing sales funnel, I think of it as three stages, right? And most people do. You go marketing at the top, sales in the middle, and uh, customer success or account management or um, there's all sorts of different ways to, to define that or call that, but basically, uh, you know, taking care of your customers. So at every single stage, you, this is your revenue funnel. At every single stage, you want to think about um, how are you creating more conversations out of the people who are in that, the top of the stage and move them down to, the, to, to lower stages. So you often think about and. Technically, you know, typically we get grouped into this category about filling your funnel. That's an easy conversion, getting a lead, right? Okay, I have now turned somebody who was not aware of our product into somebody who is, or I know somebody who might be interested in our product. That's lead generation. Everybody's got to do it. We do it very well. We do it through social. Um, and, the, and that's something that we want to, you know, always be filling that top of the funnel. So that's an easy conversion. But obviously... You want to do conversions down the funnel. So you want to go from marketing to sales and then sales into customer success, right? So marketing is really passing off when it's time to talk to a person. And then sales is passing off when it's time when they've converted into a customer. And, you know, there's different ways. Sometimes sales and account management are the same department. Sometimes marketing crosses over and does like some MDR type stuff where they talk to a person. But generally, we want to look at it in this kind of simple way. But think about it, you're always converting from marketing to sales, sales to customer success, right? But even within that, and this is where we want to go to the next step, even within that marketing and sales, and we'll, we, we're not talking about customer success today because it doesn't matter, just kidding. Um, I work in customer success. So um, even, even uh, within each stage, you're going to have several different conversion points within marketing and with, within sales. And this is really important to think about. As you're converting people down the marketing funnel, every email is calling them to some sort of action, right? It has to be. We're always calling them, what's the next step? What's the next um, call to action? What's the next conversion? What's the next uh, progressive profiling field that they can fill out in marketing? Sales, 
how do we continue to, call, you know, it's not a conversion. I mean, it's not just the sale that we're looking for. It's also the, hey, did we schedule the next meeting? Hey, did we get them on a trial? Hey, did we, you know, what is the status? And you're always, every call, as our VP of sales says, every call is a closing call. You're just closing them to different actions, right? So along, yeah. So, I, I mean, this is really what we're talking about when we say demand generation, right, down the funnel. Is it, you know, it's not just, are right, we get people in these different stages. I have a lead, maybe I find out they're going to MQL, I move them down. It's really at each step, I need to keep moving people further and further, qualifying them, mm -hmm. actually get them close to that point of sale. Um, so something like, you know, I see this all the time, marketing departments still do um, email newsletters, and it drives me crazy. Uh, now, there's a couple ways to do it really well, but in general, 99% of the time, email newsletters just don't really mean anything in marketing because there's no call to action, there's no next step, and there's no way for someone to qualify themselves as, hey, I'm going to move further down the funnel. So instead of that, you want something that someone can click through and say, oh, wait, they're interested in that topic, or, hey, I'm going to fill out this form on a landing page, or I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, unsubscribe from this newsletter right. or this email, whatever it might be, but something that's going to bring someone closer down the funnel. And I think Nate's about to say, like, unqualifying people as part of this process as well so that we, we can get closer to actual deals. Right, exactly. And that's my next point is that as you move people down each of these conversions, you want people to exit the funnel. You want them to, uh, you know, say, hey, no, I'm not qualified. Is it budget? Is it authority? Is it need? Is it time? Right? Are those four things allowing them to qualify themselves out through each conversion? Each step you're saying, hey, do you want to be interested? And they say either yes or no, essentially, by continuing to receive your emails, continue to talk to your sales team, uh, continue to move themselves down the funnel and be more interested in your product, or by saying, no, I'm tired of talking to you, or I'm tired of getting emails, I'm not going to respond, or I'm going to unsubscribe, or I'm going to cancel the meeting, right? So, but that's the whole point, is you want people to exit this. You want to know, you know, you want them to always be called to a conversion, and then basically say, yes, I want to do this, or no, I do not, because... You can't talk to everyone. You really cannot talk to everyone. And so the goal is, hey, it's important that you, you know, have those unsubscribes. Those are people you don't want to talk to anyways, and it's not worth your time. It's important that you close lost deals and sales because those are people that they're just a waste of your sales team's time. And so the, easy, the quicker your sales team is able to qualify people out and the quicker your marketing team is able to qualify people out, the better – your, the more efficient your pipeline will be, right? Because if they're just not a good fit for budget, authority, need, or time, then um, then you you just want to get them out of there. So so that's kind of um, just some thoughts about the pipeline and how to continue to bring people down the funnel to try and get them to a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the you know the important point here is that when we're talking about the funnel, we're talking about the funnel towards a sale, towards an actual deal. Um, so it's not like we're chucking people out of our system when, we, when someone's not opening emails for a month. It's that, hey, this person isn't ready for this offer right now at this time, so let's not put them through the sales cycle because that's going to be a waste of my sales team time. Instead, let's put them somewhere else and wait for them to re-engage, maybe with a different offer at a later point in time. Um, but really, a demand generation only works when you have someone who's actively interested in a deal that you can pass over to sales then eventually over to customer success. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you ever want to know what a good demand generation funnel looks like, just screenshot this and share it around. They'll be like, hey, there's like 15 arrows on that screen. I don't know what it means. <laughs> but um, so anyways, cool. So let's talk about the difference between automation uh, and, and human interaction. So I really, really want to be clear about this. This is just a principle before we get into this. these kinds of three rules. So automation – marketing automation, and even sales automation, right? So we're talking Marketo, uh, Octopus, Sprinkler, you know, posting, uh, social media management automation uh, on the marketing side, uh, side uh, also email, you know, uh, HubSpot, MailChimp, Marketo, Pardot, any of those automation tools, um, anywhere down the funnel um, uh, for automation ads, everything like that. And then on the sales side, things like outreach, uh, sales loft cadence, you know, all those automation tools that you can build on either side Automation both qualifies and nurtures, okay? That's what it does. It doesn't really do anything else in terms that humans 
converse, right? So to actually have a conversation, you need to be a human talking to another human, right? Automation is not a conversation. Humans are a conversation. Now, a human conversation can happen both on the marketing side and on the sales side, and that's important to note. Marketing, for example, uh, Tina, our, our social media manager, she has conversations all the time. Why don't you talk a little right, about yeah. that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I like to think of that very similar, actually, to the sales, you know, pipeline, um, you know, on social media. It's just one demand gen platform, right? We're posting on there all the time. We have automated messages going out. Uh, we, you know, we have a schedule that we set weeks in advance that um, is just always touching people. Even our Sociedo accounts, we're always touching people. Um, none of those are actual conversations, but they're conversation starters. And so once someone replies, then Tina, our social media manager, can follow up with them, either through direct message or by replying to a tweet or by retweeting them, and then continue the conversation. It allows her to focus her time on the people who actually want to talk to them, mm -hmm. to her, just in the exact same way that sales qualifies people through their touches. Right, exactly. And, and I think that's the key is you're always, you want to be using automation to just get them to a human, right? Because humans are going to pick up the phone and they're going to close deals better than automation will. Right. Sometimes people will come in, especially in B2B, sometimes will people, people will come in and they will close themselves as a deal. But ultimately, in B2B sales and marketing, somebody's got to pick up the phone. Somebody's got to talk to somebody in person with a, with a human conversation, right? Something that isn't automated. And people are getting better and better at detecting automation. And so you use that to start and then you, then you use that, that to qualify people so that they can talk to a human and it's most efficient, right? Got a quick comment here that I do want to address because it has to do with this in that you want to qualify people out for the right reasons. And absolutely, typically those are the four main reasons, budget, authority, need, and time. So the BANT model is very important to remember. So always be thinking about what's the, do they have the budget? Does the person have the authority? Do they have the need? And are they, are they on the right timeline? Are they, they on the same timeline? So just get, get that out there there. Cool. So let's kind of dive into um, some of the initial uh, some of the, some of those three those three rules. Sorry, that we're going to go into for actually creating conversations. And a lot of you have heard me say this before, um, but I'm going to say it again: um, content, context, and persistence. So these are the three rules for creating conversations out of leads. Now we're going to dive into them more. So don't leave yet and say, oh, I've heard Nate say this a billion times before, but I really mean this. Content, context, and persistence. And actually, we're going to go a little out of order. We're going to go content, persistence, context, but you'll see why. So let's start with content. So here's what you need to do. You need to create marketing content. You need to always be creating content that promotes your marketing message and, and really gets it. Wait, no, that's wrong. Sorry. It's Create relevant content, and I really want to get you guys into this into this stage. A lot of marketers create marketing content. What we want you to do is create relevant content, okay? There's a huge difference. Marketing content is promotional. It makes you feel good. Oh, yeah, I, we're, we got this great product. We do this great stuff. But it may ne not necessarily be what the people want to hear. You, you know, I used to work in video production and the first, people would always walk in and they'd say, I don't know where to start. I, don't, I, I know I need to do video. I don't know where to start. And I would say, look, what's the first question that your client asks you when they walk in the door? Um, and, and I always use real estate agents. They would always say, well, uh, you know, uh, what, what's the best process to find a, find a home, right? And they, and, they would say, um, and they would say, and I would say, well, answer that. And they would answer it with each had their own unique answer. And I'd say, there's your first video. Done. Let people create that content for you because they because the people who are your customers know what they want. You don't know what they want necessarily. You can figure it out with with tools and and uh, and uh, data, but but let your customers or potential customers tell you what they want. So I'm going to let Adam kind of talk about how we've done that on our end and some of our secret sauce, um, uh, starting with webinars. So yeah, yeah. So you know. When we think about, all right, what's the content that's going to actually drive leads through my funnel, both at the top and down at the bottom, part of this comes from just marketing and sales alignment. I meet pretty closely with my sales team, and we were chatting about, hey, what's, 
who are the leads that you really like talking to and which are the ones that are ready for a conversation? And I kept hearing from my sales team, hey, we love leads that are coming in off of webinars because you just had an hour-long conversation with them. They stayed for the whole time and actually signed up to hear that. Um, and so they're, they're more educated now, but they also have already expressed interest. And so we said, great. We're going to start doing webinars. So now we do a marketing webinar uh, once a week. And, you know, Nate does his customer success to senior universities as well. Uh, but now we do one once a week. And, you know, that takes a couple hours out of my time every week. But it's totally worth it because these are some of the best leads going over to sales, and they really like them. Right. Now, from a more data-driven approach, um, we, you know, we were looking at our nurture streams and trying to decide what what's kind of the content that our customers are responding to. Um, and we found hands down that people love case studies. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because you're all <laughs> marketers and you just want to hear how other people are doing things and steal their ideas. But people love case studies in our audience. Um, and so once we started figuring out how well our case studies were performing, um, I moved up case studies um, higher in our nurture streams. So you know, I have nurture programs built out for our different lead personas. And case studies were usually kind of you know at the third or the fourth touch because I figured some people would need some more educational content before they were ready to hear about how people use Sosito. But that wasn't the case. Case studies had the highest click-through rate. So I moved them up to the second touch in the nurture stream. And, you know, it was amazing. People just uh, kept clicking through at really high rates. They loved reading them, and it offered actually a really great conversation for the sales team to use as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, this one is actually a very recent example. Uh, we have a pricing page on Sosito.com. It's pretty new. You may not have seen it, um, but it explains our pricing model and everything. We have a little form to contact us if you want to learn more about our pricing model. We actually found that leads, net new leads that come in through this pricing form are our highest converting leads just across the board, almost double our other channels. <laughs> it's crazy, and part of it's because they're super interested and they just read a bunch of content about what Sosito is before filling out this form. Uh, part of it is just because they're already in the buying mode right now. They're talking about pricing so that they convert faster. So this pricing page used to be under the About section on our website, and you had to navigate a few clicks to get through it. But once we realized how great these leads were, we moved pricing up to the top-level nav and said, hey, if you want this content, let's make it as easy as possible for you to get this content. And so now that's obviously we're driving much more, you know, more leads through this process just by highlighting what customers actually want. Mm -hmm. How did you figure that out, Adam? Tell me, tell me more about the the both the conversations and the tools that you use to figure that out. Yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, it starts obviously just with organizational alignment. Um, you know, I have a weekly meeting with the sales team, with actually the entire sales team, where I sit down and I just say, "Hey, guys, what's working well? What are you hearing in your conversations? Give me some qualitative feedback." Um, and that's actually the best place to get to spark some ideas because you know there's thousands of different data points out there to look at, but if you just hear from real people the conversations that they're having. Um, it's a really clear voice of the customer, uh, literally the voice of the customer coming through um, to give me, you know, some good direction on what's working and what's not in our industry. Uh, from there, I really love diving into Google Analytics. Mm. I, I pretty much live in Google Analytics. And so the pricing page one, actually, not only do we find out that those leads converted at one of the highest rates, but the second top search term, bringing people into Sosito.com, was Sosito pricing because people wanted to know. They were really curious, and they couldn't find the pricing page. And so it was a clear indicator to me that, wow, we need to make this more visible for people because right. people are actually looking for it. And the same thing with the inside sales team case study here. Uh, we found so many people navigating organically to this case study because they were super interested in these topics of lead scoring and nurturing with Sosito. And so the click-through rate, even organically, was really high on it in addition to the click-through rates and the conversion rates off of emails um, mm -hmm. by using Marketo and looking at that data. Right. So what, what I think is important to note is that though we push content out there, we, we allow our, our prospects and our customers and our vi website visitors to determine what the best content is. What, what's that relevant content? This is how we create relevant content is that we, you know, sometimes we write content and it, doesn't do so well. Mm -hmm. And we have those meetings to say, why didn't it do well? What happened here? And then we, we tweak and use that data to kind of create better and better content every single time. And so that people are, it's stuff that people are interested in. It's not marketing content, it's relevant content, right? It's just, it happens to be written or produced by our marketing team sometimes. Right, so. right, yeah. Cool. 
So that's that's content, right? That's how you kind of bring people, you know, automate people or, or allow your enable your um, sales team or marketing team to actually start bringing people down the funnel is with content that's relevant. We now have to talk about persistence. Now, let me let me just preface this. If you nail persistence, you will set yourself apart from the rest. And it does not matter, I, I kid you not, it doesn't matter how many times I say this or how many times people post this on LinkedIn, people will not do it. And it's because they're afraid of a rejection, they don't like picking up the phone, they, they, are, you know, they don't look at it the way that we look at it or, or a lot of people or some people look at it and those people are set apart. But persistence is key and what that means is you got to follow up and then you got to do it again. And then you got to get to do it again and again and again and again. And and I really mean this. You cannot be afraid. I mean, it, this I, this works. You cannot be afraid of following up with people and really, really trying to either qualify them out or qualify them in, right? And and again, this will set you apart if you are able to follow up with people. It, it is... So, so not done, and I'll show you what, what happens here. So basically, I ran over last night as I was finalizing this deck, and uh, I snapped a picture, kind of I ducked under a salesperson's desk and snapped a picture of something that sits on their wall. So, you know, I, you can't tell them that I showed you this because <laughs> this is our secret sauce here. I'm serious about this, but I was able to snap a quick picture of something that sits on all of our salespeople's cubicle walls, and that is this picture <clears throat> or this document formula to convert leads into pipeline if that's not clear then I don't know what it is but basically they have and if you see I'm sorry for the grainy quality but you know I was trying to grab it through the you know through the desk there and so anyways um, day one phone call with voicemail follow up on email Day two, phone call, no voicemail. Day three, email and interact on social media. It's LinkedIn, Twitter, something like that. Uh, day four, no contact. Day five, no contact. Day six, phone, you know, and this goes down all the way to day 10. This has been printed out and posted on every single salesperson's wall. And as we hire more salespeople, this is posted on everybody's wall. The key is we want to get them on a conversation. And the only way we're going to do that is persistence. If you look up at the top, Contact probability, this is real statistics. First attempt, 39% chance of contact. Second attempt, 72% chance of contact. Sixth attempt, that's the 93% chance of contact. And I want to reiterate that. On the sixth attempt, there's a 93% probability of a conversation. That is why you need to be persistent. To turn more leads into conversations, you have to be persistent. And, and always be following up. And this works at the marketing level as well as at the mm -hmm. sales level. This is not just a sales thing. You have to remind people because people are forgetful. They have tons of messages coming at them all the time. We need to always be persistent. If you really believe this is a good lead, go after them. Be persistent with it. Yeah, I mean, this is really the, the foundation of lead nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, someone's not going to respond right away at the first email. They might not respond at the second email. Um, but they're going to eventually find one that piques their interest enough that comes at them one at a time that they're not too busy to open the email, right? There's a ton of reasons why someone can't respond right away. Um, but if you keep at it um, in a way that's not annoying, in a way that's not just blatant spam and automation, but in a way that's actually useful to them with relevant content, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you can start to actually increase those open rates. And, you know, literally at our own um, email nurturing programs here in Sosito, our open rates start getting into the 30 and 40 percent again once we get to the fourth touch and the fifth touch. Mm -hmm. It's not on that second touch, right? We have a really great first touch because it's warm and it's new and that's great, and then people think it falls off, but it actually picks back up again if you keep with it long enough because, one, you know, you're weeding down the funnel, you're getting to more interested people, but um, you're also starting to continue to remind them, get to that rich content and figure out what they really like. And so as long as you're sending them the relevant content over time, um, eventually something will pique their interest. Yeah, and w one example for me, I was getting reached out to by this person um, who wanted to sell me some software, right? Um, kept sending me emails. I even clicked on the email, and I hovered over the link in the email, and I saw that it was a, sal uh, it was a sales loft cadence email. So they were, it was automated, right? It's just an automated email. 
But by the third time, I really was like, okay, I'm really interested in what this person has to say because they had some interesting content. They kept following up with me. And then I think the fourth email that they sent, I kind of, I actually responded and I said, said, all right, looks like Sales Loft got me. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> and we had a conversation. Unfortunately, their product isn't quite there yet. It's still in beta mode. But it was, it was so interesting that like, I, and it wasn't because I was trying to prove a point. It was just I was actually interested in what they had to say because they were producing good content and they kept following up with me. They were always at the top of my inbox. It's not that I didn't want to see their product. I do. It's just that I'm busy and need to be reminded. So always be thinking about that. You know, people who qualify themselves out, they don't want to talk to you, right? That's fine, at least right now. They may later, but right now, again, budget authority need time is not right. Fine, qualify themselves out. But the people who do want to talk to you may not remember on the first or second or third or fourth attempt. Mm -hmm. Get them, keep persisting because you're offering a valuable product and you want to get in touch with these people. I think that's super, super key. Cool. All right, so back to this slide. Persistence, follow up, do it again and then again and again and again. Well, I gave you an asterisk uh, next to follow up. I will complete that right now. Follow up with relevant content. So this is where we tie it right back to that relevant content because this is actually how you have context. So this completes that content, context, and persistence is you always need to be following up with relevant value add content to people, right? And what that means is, hey, if we connected on social media, so if I, uh, if I connected with somebody through Socito on social media, then my first email to them should be me saying, hey, we connected on Twitter, right? Acknowledge that we connected on Twitter. If I had a conversation with them and called them and had a conversation with them over the phone, then my next email to them should always reference that conversation, and then I should try and pull out some sort of marketing content or case study that has to do with their industry, right? Always be following up with context. And this isn't just like, hey, I saw this webinar that I think you'd be interested in. It's hey, we connected on social, and I saw you were tweeting about hashtag big data. Well, you know, like we've got this software package that helps you with data management. Or, hey, for our, our case, hey, I saw you tweeting about hashtag content marketing. Well, here's, here's, the, here's why we're really good at, for content marketers, because we plug people in the top of the funnel, and we work well with people who are producing good content, right? So, it's always, always important. The more context that you inc include in your follow-ups with relevant content, the better you're going to get, the better engagements you will get um, uh, from people and the better conversations that you will get. And this is where you have to play that automation and human line, right? At what point does your attempt to provide good context just look stupid, right? At what point do you say, you send them and say, oh, hey, I saw you tweeting about hashtag content marketing or hashtag marketing, and they're like, yeah, I was saying marketing sucks, right? Like, at what point do you look stupid? And at that point, you need to inject a human to actually come in and audit all of that. So this is how we tie it all together. Get, bring that persistence, bring that content, put it all into a, a contextual follow-up cadence and, and, uh, and, you know, build that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this happens even, you know, third, fourth, fifth touch down the funnel. Um, you know, if, if I'm nurturing someone and sending them a bunch of, like, you know, generic lead gen and demand gen on social content, and then I find out that they're using Marketo, guess what? Their nurture stream is going to change, and the next email they get is going to be like, hey, as a Marketo user, did you know this and this and this? Now, all of a sudden, I have relevant content for them that they're actually interested in, and it comes with context. It's, hey, because of this, I'm sending you this. Um, and again, same thing. When we pass over leads to sales, it's always for a reason. It's not just, oh, they're, they visited a web page and their lead score increased two points to get them over the threshold. I'm going to send them over. No, it's, hey, look, they just watched this webinar. They mm -hmm. just downloaded this white paper. Sales, you have something to talk about now. And that's why I continue sending alerts to the sales team when they do another one of those actions. So that sales has a reason for their follow-up call. The next time that they talk to them, they have something to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, one of the one of the best examples I have of that is actually from uh, a marketing automation company um, based in Massachusetts. 
if that gives you any hint, uh, that uh, that uh, I visited their pricing page one day and immediately got an email from them saying, hey, just saw you visited our pricing page. Totally automated, but it was really good. It was a very well-written email, and, and I opened it, and I responded to that. So I think that's that's very key is catch people where they are, be relevant, and, and always be, you know, updating your, your activities and stuff like that. Um, one of the ways, by the way, side note, that, that – we can help out with this is social lead monitoring. We actually can monitor any, not just your handle, but hashtags and other other uh, potentially competitors' handles. Inject that into Marketo, and then have that go into uh, Salesforce or or Dynamics's interesting moments. And and theoretically, you could follow up and say, "Hey, I saw you tweeting about hashtag content marketing," or um, "This is you. You might be interested in our in our marketing offering, or something like that." And we have data to say that people who are tweeting about topics that we're interested in, they close faster, higher average sales price. Um, uh, even people you know who follow your competitors will probably close at a faster rate or higher average sales price. So, just a side note there. Cool. All right, so let's talk about marketing and sales. So now that we're kind of done with our, our three principles, let's talk about how we need to kind of bring marketing and sales together on creating these good conversations. Well, this is what often happens between marketing <laughs> and sales. They fight. I'm glad I'm at the bottom of the funnel because I don't have to deal with that. You know, I just sit with my customers and it's great. Um, but there's, you know, sometimes the boxing gloves come out. Um, sometimes our ping pong table gets real hot between marketing and sales. Um, uh, that's why Adam doesn't play. He's just like, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, it's actually the hot debate is between me and our product team. That's the real like hot uh, ping pong games here. But anyways, so to get marketing and sales aligned, it really comes down to one thing. It's this line in the middle, right? Like where do you set that line, right? Is it you know, at what point does marketing, first of all, at what point does marketing stop owning a lead and it becomes sales? How long is sales allowed to have that lead before it becomes marketing's again? What is sales' responsibility? What is marketing's responsibility? What's an MQL? I mean, all of these things come down to that line, and that is why you have to have an agreement between marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this really goes back to, uh, you know, what we talked about at the very first slide of this webinar, that funnel that you looked at. Um, marketing's always qualifying people out. Sales is going to qualify people out. We need to know what's that point where sales can actually take up that um, that responsibility without it being a burden on their own time and their mm -hmm. efforts to actually close deals. Um, so figuring, it doesn't matter where that line is, but um, there has to be, you know, this kind of set line in the sand that says this is our definition for this month, and maybe it'll change next month. Right. But this is going to be my definition right now. And a lot of that has to do with the types of activities that each organization is best at. Uh, so we have a very content-heavy um, marketing organization here at Sosito. So we do all the social media, the nurturing. We do, you know, we create the white papers. We do all the webinars and everything. Uh, but we have a very um, active and phone-heavy sales organization. Yeah. So they're doing the immediate follow-ups off of those webinars. They're the ones actually doing that. Um, they do the demos. They're getting people into the trials. And then obviously they're actually working the deals there. And so, you know, we've broken it up this way. When sales needs uh, more content or, you know, a white paper to help move a deal, marketing will pick up the reins there. But if, if sales just needs to qualify a few more people down the funnel, they're the ones that are going to hop on the phone to do that. And so we have that broken up um, kind of that way. And, you know, obviously this changes over time. Right. So let's talk about the agreement that we actually have in place. Yeah, so. and so part of the agreement is not just what are our responsibilities, but then, okay, based off of the efforts that I'm doing, what am I actually going to give over to sales? So it starts on the marketing side of how much does sales need to grow for the next month. And so, for example, this is literally our data this month. Um, I'm growing our leads, and you know, to qualify here, this is the leads I'm passing over to sales is growing by 25% this month. Now, I know that seems really high <laughs> to a lot of people, um, that's because, because it is. Because it is, right? <laughs> because we're high growth here. Uh, but also because, you know, that lead definition changes based on sales needs. So we have a growing sales team, and so they're working different types of leads now. So I can grow the amount of leads that I'm passing over, but once we've defined that, I'm set to hit that 25% growth in MQLs passed over month over month. Um, and then the quality matters as well. So, you know, I told my, my sales VP, hey, look, 30% of those are going to have a MarTech platform that Sosito can integrate with, either Marketo, HubSpot, or Pardot. Um, and 75% of those leads are going to be in free trials. The other 25% are 
might be from a webinar or from a white paper or something else like that. And so this allows sales to prepare and know exactly what to expect and how to build out their pipelines. In reverse, sales promises me that they're going to actually touch and work every lead that I send over. Uh, because if they don't, that's a waste of my database. Because what happens is then, you know, a month from now, Jack comes back to me and says we need another 25% growth. And I say, well, I just ran out of leads because you took all of mine and you didn't even work them. Mm -hmm. That's not a good place to be in. So in return, sales is going to actually work every lead I send over. And if they can't touch them, you know, within that 10-day pipeline, they send them back to me. And they become a marketing lead again to requalify down the road. And so this is our service level agreement, if you will, um, between our two organizations um, that I'm going to supply sales with this and sales is going to actually work those leads. And again, it's subject to change. And literally, it's Sosito, you know, it's fun working at a startup. It's also really frustrating because literally <laughs> my, my MQL definition changes, um, you know, every couple of weeks here. Um, so, you know, it's just how it goes. But as long as we're all in the same um, kind of in agreement here, all in the same boat, uh, you know, we can actually be productive and get things done. Right. Well, and I think that's key. I mean, we had a huge, um, we saw a huge change when Jack came in here and said, we're going to call down on every lead. Um, right. And I think that was huge because then that controls the lead flow that we actually send over <clears throat> because that way we, you know, we can set a higher bar for leads. And, um, and then also, you know, that way there's a good agreement between sales and, and uh, marketing, Right. Um, so that that's kind of how it works, and it's it, it's extremely. It, I've seen a very from the outside looking in. I've seen a very very uh, good change in in how our lead pipeline works, and mm -hmm. and saying hey, sales has to follow up with every single person, but then marketing has to respond to their requests, and it's a great working relationship that I see. Again, this is from my desk where I just get to look over and see that happen, but you know, it's all sorts of fun. So right. And this, I mean, again, not to, to beat this into the ground here, but when we're talking about turning leads into conversations, um, really the agreement between marketing and sales is that handoff between that automation and that conversation there. Uh, and so once this line and this agreement is set into the, stand, the, in the sand here, then we actually know, all right, here's what my demand gen pipeline looks like. Here's the conversion rates that I need to expect. Here's the type of channels that I should look out for. Here's the leads that I need. And so wherever I'm doing my demand gen, whether it's through Sosita, whether it's through paid advertising, I know how many leads I need to touch, where I need to put my money, and what kind of conversion rate to expect in order to hit my agreement with sales. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. We run a tight ship here. We do, it? we do. Uh, by the way, great questions coming in. Keep asking, and we're almost to our question slide here. So uh, happy, to, happy to help you uh, figure out more things as well. Remember, we're good resources here. Uh, Adam's like, a Marketo whiz, marketing whiz, so feel free to ask him any questions as well. So, um, But before we get there, I do want to talk about um, testing because really this, all of this, all that we've talked about here, you know, the funnel, what the conversions are, creating relevant content, uh, persistence, the actual follow-up cadence, the context that we give people, none of this would have any power without testing. Testing is key, and we here at Sosito are very data-driven, and we encourage everybody to be extremely data-driven. And I'm not talking about, oh, I you know, have proved this with data because I feel like it. No, actually get real hard, statistically significant data that proves out um, uh, what, what you've decided. Don't hold, and this is one thing that we're, we're very big on here, and I really encourage people to, don't hold your idea with too much emotion, right? Because always allow, I think one of the best piece of advice that I got was from one of our customers who's a great who's a great guy. His name is Estol, and he runs a company called Undelay. They do landing page uh, design, right? And he said, you know, ultimately, my, my business partner and I will talk and talk and talk and argue about one thing, and then ultimately come down to, well, we should just test it. And that's, I think, how we operate here is, like, we'll talk about things and be like, well, what if this will work or what? Well, just test it. And when you think about testing, let's think about it practically. If you have six salespeople, you know, maybe do three on one, one follow-up strategy where they do, you know, six calls over five days, and then the other three on a 10 calls over 15 days strategy, right? Like, build, it, build what makes sense and then test it. And then use that testing to figure out, okay, who converted more? Just track that data. 
design the test well and track that data. And then in marketing, how do you guys run run your testing uh, and, and track all that? Well, I mean, it depends, right? Like, if we're looking at just uh, campaigns and how quickly our fun- leads are moving down our funnel, A-B testing is the place where you've got to start, right? And so we got to say, all right, which ones are which campaigns are actually letting me uh, convert leads and you know go to the form fills and click through the emails and anything that I'm looking at at a conversion and so you know pretty much anything we're doing will spin up an A/B test whether it's something as simple as changing the subject line, testing the color of a demo button, mm. or actually driving to completely two separate pages and seeing which one can convert someone better than the other. Um, so that's you know step one. Every marketing department hopefully at this point is doing some sort of A/B testing. But really, everything can and should be A/B tested. From there, you know, again, conversion lead to conversation is the ultimate golden number. Um, and so, you know, we like to talk about that as terms of MQLs to opportunities created from marketing to sales. All right, good leads that marketing found. How did we turn them into conversations for sales to be able to pick up the phone and call them? Um, and so, we look at this really um, source by source on which. Uh, you know, lead sources are converting faster to opportunities than other sources. Yeah. And so one thing we've found internally here is that, uh, you know, so we mentioned earlier, leads who come through the pricing form on the pricing page convert at the highest rate of any other source of leads. Okay, fantastic. So we, you know, we moved up the, the pricing page and everything, and we thought of, for a second of, hey, maybe this means we should be offering demos more. Mm. And so we said, all right, well, what if we, what if we have a call to action that's, a free demo before the trial. Now that was a big radical idea, and no one was like, oh, we're not ready to, to go all the way to demo, so we said, let's test it. So if you actually go to Sosito.com right now, there are two call to action buttons there. Mm-hmm. And not many marketing departments will let themselves put two call to action buttons <laughs> on a landing page. And I know some people are gonna give me some flack for it, but you know what, we're testing it right now. Right. This isn't a long-term decision, but what we're gonna say is, is it easier to get people into free trials? Is it easier to have a demo conversation? which one actually works better. And that MQL to opportunity number is the golden number that's going to decide our marketing strategy going forward. Yep. Some people here really like trials, but guess what? Whatever ends up being the result of this this test is really what's going to inform our strategy going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'll just reiterate, like, there are some webinars that I really love to doing that get us zero leads. <laughs> and it's, it's you know, sad because I'll put a bunch of work into it, you know, I'll spend hours on it, and we'll have a lot of fun with it, and maybe it's fun content. Uh, but it just doesn't convert leads. And so, you know, we have to take a step back and say, all right, we're not going to do webinars like those anymore. We're going to do maybe, you know, other ones that are more specific on, you know, MarTech. That actually gets us the MarTech leads so I can hit that 30% MarTech number that we need, right, rather than doing some fun, like, social media type webinars. Um, So anyways, the point being here is uh, look at those different conversion rates in your pipeline that's actually sending leads over to sales. Um, and, and spin up different campaigns that are actually driving people in two different places to see what's converting the best. Yeah, uh, I, I do want to move on to questions uh, here soon, but I, so uh, keep asking them. But um, really, really quickly, just a side note: one of the things that we've talked about as a company value here is that you know we we don't we don't take ourselves too seriously, and I think that's the key here with testing. Right? I, it really comes back to that. It's like nobody here says like I'm right and that's it. Right? Everybody holds their ideas a little bit loosely as if, as in, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe at some point I could be wrong and that's okay. And we'll call each other out and be like, hey, this is not how it is. Um, and that's okay. We, we're very, very culturally that way. And I think that it starts with, you know, as you start saying, hey, look, I'm going to test this and I could be wrong is a very interesting attitude shift that will produce better results. As you continue to test and continue to say, I'm not here to prove anything right. I'm just here to say, this is, I want to get better. That's going to get you better results. Um, and that's why testing is hugely important. So as you think of, of any of these, uh, any of the things that we talked about today, it's all backed up by some testing that we've done at some point and will continue to be improved by testing. Um, so I think that's that's a good summary of why testing is important. So design your tests, make them scientific, run them, run them again, keep keep doing that. All right. Let's do questions. Do you guys have any other questions? Keep those questions yeah. flowing in. So we have one coming in from Jessica right now um, who you know, says, you might have covered this already, but I what actually is a sales conversion? Interesting. 
a sales conversion. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of different, this, this is a great question. There's a couple of different ways to define a sales conversion, right? Um, so it, it really depends on the sales team itself, right? Are, uh, uh, you know, what, so every single day, so if you look at that lead pipeline, sorry, I'm collecting my thoughts here. Great question. So every, if you look at that lead pipeline that we gave you, right, that our sales team has, every day, on that pipeline, every day of the 10 days that they have on there is a conversion, right? Okay, when I've converted from day one to day two, that's a conversion, right? I've called them, I've left them as well, and I sent an email. Then day two, I've called them, I did social media interaction. Day three, no response, no action, that's still a conversion. You're converting them the next day. That way we know, okay, we're converting them every single day, and they're literally going to Salesforce and converting them from lead stage to lead stage. Then... When that person responds and says, yes, I want a trial or yes, I want to be engaged, then we call uh, them a, uh, then they, the sales team converts them into a lead or into a, into a contact and into an account and ha opens an opportunity. That's a conversion. Then them getting onto a trial is a conversion, right? So there's all sorts of conversions along the way. And then obviously the ultimate conversion is them into a, um, into a paying customer and into an agreement. The key is at that um, at that point uh, we are we're calling it a final conversion, but they're they're really trying to every call is a closing call. They're always trying to get them to the next step. So we're always trying to say what's the next step that we can evaluate uh, and and get people moving to. So yeah, does that answer your question? I hope that answers Jessica's question. So. Yeah. We have a kind of a follow-up one from Evan here, ask, you know, saying you're, the sales team formula you just described hinges on calling folks and leaving voicemails. Does that same formula apply if you um, only have an email address mm -hmm. or a LinkedIn profile? Can you follow up as persistently Ooh. with messaging, or should you, uh, you know, try to find their number, call them directly? Um, I'll answer this one real quick first yeah, because yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a personal one for me actually because not every lead I send over to sales has a phone number, right? And so the first kind of week we implemented this new lead pipeline, there was some stop gaps and people were like, uh, wait, wait, not all of these leads have phone numbers. Adam, right. where's their phone number? I'd be like, I, I don't have it, sorry. Um, and so we had to figure out what to do. Um, the answer is yes, you should still have the same lead conversion steps as any other lead. Obviously, the strategy is going to be a little bit different. And no, you can't be as persistent with emails as you can with a phone. Right. So, you know, when the first day says, call, you know, and leave a voicemail, that might just be one email, right, right? which is equivalent. Um, the next day, call, don't leave a voicemail. You're probably not going to send a follow-up email 24 hours. I mean, maybe you will, depending on your sales cycle, but maybe there's another day that's blank in there. They're still moving to through the funnel. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a slightly different strategy on that. And it, absolutely, and I think that the key here is, you know, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a phone number, uh, not the best option, um, but that's where we could also use uh, progressive profiling or something in marketing mm -hmm. automation to add that phone number. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But second of all, let's say we don't get that phone number. This is where social media comes into play. If you're just relying on email follow-ups, even if social media is your first touch and then all you're doing is, is email past that, then you're missing out on a huge opportunity. Social media is a really great way to get access to people. Um, who you don't have other contact information for. LinkedIn is great. Twitter is great. If they've come through Socito, you'll have their Twitter handle. You'll have their LinkedIn profile most likely. Use those channels to actually follow up with people. And the more successful salespeople will always be following up using other channels besides just email and phone. Because phone is a over 100-year-old channel and email is getting up to be like a 20-year-old channel. In digital marketing, that's that's pretty old right now. So, you know, let's find new ways to interact with people, and that's the way that you're going to actually convert more people. Uh, so Miles wants to know, if you're qualifying someone, is that the same as converting them to the next stage? Yeah, if you're qualifying someone in, I would call that converting someone to the next stage at that point, right? Because every time I say you're going to the next stage, you've said, you know, a Basically, you're saying a percentage of people will not go to the next stage and a percentage of people will go to the next stage and you're one of those people that will go to the next stage. The point of qualifying people in or moving people, converting people to the next stage and looking at it that way is that that way you can 
A, always be always remember to call somebody to do an action, which is convert to the next stage, whatever that next stage is. And then B, you can track it, right? So you can say, oh, my conversion rate from stage, you know, 10 to 11, sales stage, you know, day 6 to day 7 is really low. Why is that? And that way you can get so granular and say, well, maybe the content in stage 8 needs to be better, or stage 7 needs to be better, or stage 6 needs to be better, and then you can start moving that and testing that and seeing how each stage converts. So yes, you're always qualifying yeah. someone in. For, a, for a, you know, just kind of a simple version of that, like a form fill does both. It qualifies and converts, just like any kind of step in the process. I fill out a form with my data. If the in, inputs I have on the fields qualify me as mm -hmm. an MQL, then I will be converted to an MQL stage. If they don't qualify me, I will not convert further down the funnel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the same true as the sales touch pipeline when someone's calling trying to qualify them. Um, if you're moving someone from one stage to another, from one nurture stream to another, um, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Right. It's just process. Right. Um, great. So looks like Brian has some um, technical questions about... Do duplicating from client current lists. current client list? Can we import? Yeah, uh, Breen, great questions coming in. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sorry, Adam. Adam doesn't know you. Uh, so Breen is um, uh, asking some good questions. Um, I might follow up on email. Just we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll follow up with uh, Breen on some of these technical questions um, here. Let's see. How easily should you make it for? Any, any ones that we should be addressing out of there? How easy do you make it for people to qualify themselves out? Um, insanely easy. My So Jack, our sales VP, he has a saying um, that says, let a lead disqualify <laughs> themselves. Um, yeah. So give them, you know, be persistent, right? There, there's two, it's not like you're not trying to convert them. So keep working them until they say no but um, give them each opportunity at that stage to say, no, I'm not the right person. So what, do you, what information do you need to know at this stage to know whether they can progress or not and make it very explicit, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, for us, again, this MarTech leads are really important to us. So now the first piece of data that I'm actually gathering on every lead coming through is do they have a MarTech system or not? And if they don't, all right, you know what, we're, we can pull right. them out of that funnel, right? right? First per thing people, our sales guys talk about when they're on the call with them is how are you currently doing marketing? Right. Do you have a way to follow up with leads? Yeah. If the answer is no, you know, they're not moving through that pipeline. So right. uh, it, you, you do want people out of your funnel. Right. It's, it's good, you know, coming up with good qualifying questions at both the marketing and sales stages are, is, is the key, right? And so you make it easy by asking the right questions. And so um, that will make your pipeline more efficient. And, and again, it's about knowing, you know, not not being upset that somebody qualified themselves out of your funnel. It's okay. They're probably not a good fit, at least at this point, right, for BANT reasons. So allow people to qualify themselves out with good questions and develop good questions around that. So I think we're out of time. These are like crazy awesome questions coming through. Breen, I will follow up with you via email. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us, uh, adam at sociedo.com or nate at sociedo.com or just university at sociedo.com. That'll get to us. Before we go, I do, do I have a little homework here for everybody left here. So first of all, identify three conversions within your stage. So marketing or sales, identify what are three individual conversions with, already within your stage. Just like we said, you know, like, you know, from lead to opportunity, from opportunity to trial. Those are conversions in marketing. Um, um, yeah, so someone who clicks through an email, now they're an actively interested lead. I'm going to move them down. Uh, from someone who attends a webinar, now they're, you know, a qualified lead, so I'm going to move them over. Um, from someone who, you know, actually fills out the pricing page form, now they're a hot lead. And I'm going to send them over to sales, right? Yeah, yeah. And then also identify your best content. So I want you to take some of the tools that we've, we've said, Google Analytics, um, conversations with your sales team, Two from marketing, one from sales. What's your best content? What's your best performing content? Now, sales content, some people are going to be like, sales content? Yeah, the emails that they write, the talk tracks that they say. That's good content. So talk to your salespeople. Figure out what converts the best. What's the breakup email that converts the best, even though I hate breakup emails? But what's the one that converts the best? And identify those. And then if you get a chance, 
Identify those three conversions and three of your best content pieces, two from marketing, one from sales, and send it to us, university at Sociedo.com, and we'd love to help you guys out with, uh, with you know, potentially tweaking that and making it even better. <clears throat> and then next steps, before we go, um, build your new content strategy off of your best content that we've identified. Build a new sales touch strategy um, with good follow-ups and good content. Um, Develop an agreement between sales and marketing, so build that agreement if you haven't already, and of course, register for Sociedo University. Our next class is specifically on integrations, which has to do a lot with this, the kind of marketing side of, of the automation, uh, actual getting conversations, because uh, we'll be talking about how those leads flow into your, into your CRM or MarTech and how you want to follow up with people. Um, so with that, we can, uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll end here. If you have any other questions or suggestions or anything like that, please email them our way. We always want to create relevant content here, as I said. Um, so always, always good to uh, hear from, from customers, from, uh, from other people who are coming through to our website, what we could do better, what topics you want to hear us cover. And then, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep uh, revving on our, on our Sociedad University and want to make you more of a part of it. So we'll see you in two weeks. And have a great rest of your day.